If you have your Bibles with you, be turning to the book of Nehemiah, to the book of Nehemiah, chapter 13. Nehemiah chapter 13. This is where we'll, we'll start tonight. Nehemiah chapter 13. But I would also encourage you to turn to um, 2 Corinthians chapter 6. 2 Corinthians chapter 6. We'll read a couple verses from there as well. 2 Corinthians chapter 6. Nehemiah 13 and 2 Corinthians chapter 6. We're on... Lesson number 10 tonight, we're winding down. Um, lesson number 10, and then the last two weeks, lesson 11 and lesson 12 for the next two weeks after that. Um, if you remember from last week, we read the entire chapter of Nehemiah chapter 9. Uh, it was a long chapter, but it recounted the history of the people of Israel, um, why they were in the situation that they were in currently in chapter 9. And then chapter 10, we read about the names of this of, that were on the covenant, this firm covenant that they were making with God and the details of that covenant in, in chapter 10. And so what I kind of want to warn you about is that the next three weeks are essentially going to be a repeat of kind of the same type of theme. And I say that because the, la- the last three uh, lessons basically center around chapter 13. And so what we're going to do is basically break it down into different sections, uh, and we'll do the first section tonight, uh, but we're going to be looking at chapter 13 essentially for the next three weeks, and so it's going to seem like a more of a repeat than our last lesson, so just kind of a, a warning about that. But we'll be in Nehemiah chapter 13 and 2 Corinthians chapter 6 here in just a moment. But before we begin, let's, let's bow our heads in a word of prayer together. <clears throat> Holy and righteous Father in heaven, we come before you this evening with humble hearts, gracious hearts, knowing that it is it's through you that we have everything we could even want or need in this life. It is through your mighty hand, your giving hand, that we are blessed. You have given us so much, but none of it compares to the gift of your Son. Thank you, Father, for his sacrifice, his, his life, his resurrection, his victory over death. It is through that resurrection that we have hope, hope of eternal life with you one day. Help us, Father, to, to recognize and always be gracious and to always be thankful for what you have done for us. We are, we are created in your image. Therefore, help us to live in a way that honors you, our Creator. We thank you, Father, for the members of this congregation, for the men and women who labor here, who teach, who who send cards, who contact members who are struggling, for all the things that make your church a loving and welcoming place to be. We thank you, Father, for each and every one of them pray that you would continue to be with our elders, with our deacons, with Josh. Guide them, Father. Direct them. May they always use your word for their standard on how to lead us. Father, help us to be a membership, to be members that is willing to be led. Help us to be members that our leaders would desire to lead. Give us a receptive heart, a tender heart, to know that these men are not perfect. It is through through you that your church can be perfected. Father, as we study this lesson this evening, help us to draw lines, just like Nehemiah did. He was not willing to compromise your truth, your ways for any, any type of gain in his life. But he was a true leader. Help us to learn from his example. Give us, give us wisdom. Give us strength to know when an association with something that is sinful or so, something that is worldly begins to influence us in a way that will pull us from you. Help us to draw lines of fellowship. That we would not be a people that would accept anything lower than your standard of truth. Help us, Father, to encourage others who 
who are being influenced by this world around us, to open doors of opportunity for us, Father, to, to teach, to encourage, and maybe most importantly, just to listen. We pray that if anyone needs to make their life right tonight, that they would do so. That they would not hesitate, Father, to allow your powerful and comforting hand be upon them. Father, we pray that you would be with each and every one of us as we study and teach throughout this building, Father. Be with our young ones. Be with their hearts. We love you, Father. Thank you for loving us first. And in Jesus' name that we pray. Amen. Nehemiah chapter 13. Let's begin reading in verse number 1. Nehemiah chapter 13, starting there in verse 1. We'll also be in 2 Corinthians chapter 6. We'll read verses 14 and 16 in just a moment. Nehemiah chapter 13, starting there in verse 1. It says, On that day they read from the book of Moses in the hearing of the people, and in it was found written that no Ammonite or Moabite should ever enter the assembly of God. For they did not meet the people of Israel with bread and water, but hired Balaam against them to curse them. Yet our God turned the curse into a blessing. As soon as the people heard the law, they separated from Israel all those of foreign descent. Now before this, Elishib the priest, who was appointed over the chambers of the house of our God, and who was related to Tobiah, prepared for Tobiah a large chamber where they had previously put the grain offering, the frankincense, the vessels, the tithes of grain, wine and oil, which were given by commandment to the Levites, singers and gatekeepers, and the contributions for the priests. While this was taking place, I was not in Jerusalem, for in the 32nd year of Artaxerxes, king of Babylon, I went to the king. And after some time, I asked leave of the king and came to Jerusalem, and then I discovered the evil that Elisha had done for Tobiah, preparing for him a chamber in the courts of the house of God, and I was very angry. And I threw all the household furniture of Tobiah out of the chamber. Then I gave orders, and they cleansed the chambers, and I brought back there the vessels of the house of God with the grain offering and the frankincense. The title of this lesson is I Drew Line of Fellowship. I Drew Line of Fellowship. And when you hear a term like that, what does the author mean here by this word fellowship? What is he talking about? Yeah, Craig. The word itself um, comes from the same, in the New Testament, the same Greek word as communion, sharing. Sure. Um, so that's that's what the word itself means. It means a sharing in something, a communion together with something. Yeah. So There's a... It's a deep association. A deep association. There's a spiritual partnership here. And, and so if... I didn't write this material, but I probably would have picked a, a different word than fellowship because it's, I think what, as we go through this material, you'll, you'll realize that he's not meaning it in a way that maybe we would use it today for the New Testament. And what he's talking about here specifically is, is there an association, is there a partnership with righteousness and sin or things that they should be doing God's commands, God's laws, and the things that they were doing in the past, why they were in this situation. And the reason I say that is because here we are in 2 Corinthians chapter 6, and it says in verse 14, Do not be unequally yoked with unbelievers, for what partnership has righteousness with lawlessness? Or what fellowship has light with darkness? What accord has Christ with Belial? Or what portion does a believer share with an unbeliever? What agreement has the temple of God with idols? For we are the temple of the living God. I think what he's getting at here is this, this deep association, this communion, this spiritual partnership um, of things going together that shouldn't be. Right? So Paul is writing light and darkness, righteousness and sin. These things don't go together. Right? We understand what that is in modern day. Ohio State and Michigan. Right? They don't go together. They, they go against each other, right? Same what Paul is writing here. These things have no relationship with each other, so they shouldn't even be in the same thought together. And so here we are in Nehemiah chapter 13, 
And what's happened? Right? What's happened? The priest, the high priest, is allowing who to come into the presence of the temple. We've heard this name before. Uh, Tobiah. Tobiah, right? And he is from where? It doesn't say it in chapter 13 there. You have to go back. You have to remember what we have studied in the past. He's a very strong opponent of Nehemiah. Is he a Jew? He is not a Jew, right? And so, what Nehemiah is getting at here in chapter 13 is this guy who's not a Jew should not even be in the presence of these people, let alone living in the temple. You look at... um, Verse 3, as soon as the people heard the law, they separated from Israel all those of foreign descent. So remember chapter 10, right? Chapter 10 had three covenants. What were they? This is a review from last week. Three separate covenants that were tied into one, one covenant that they signed. What were the three things that they would say that they would do? Restore their marriages. Restore their marriages. Okay, so what were they doing before? They were marrying people of foreign descent. What was the second thing? Keep the Sabbath. Keep the Sabbath day holy. What were they doing? They were buying and trading, selling, working on the Sabbath. And the third thing is... Support the temple. You went back and looked, didn't you, Ed? Yeah, I got it on my note. (laughs) They were... Neglecting the contribution to the temple, weren't they? They they were they were being greedy. They were being prideful. They um, being uh, very materialistic in their giving. They weren't giving at all, essentially. And so, with these three things, the three three things that they were struggling with, they made this covenant, and now they're on the right track. So, when it comes to the phrase, "I'm going to draw a line in the sand," what does that what comes to mind? What does that mean? Draw a line and say, yeah, David. Well, it wasn't, you know, a line that was based upon somebody's feelings or emotions or, right. you know, how they felt about something. It was, it was based on uh, the law. I mean, that's what they read in here. Yep. The law of Moses forbid Ammonite, Moabite. The buyer was an Ammonite. Yep. And he was in the chambers of the temple, yep. which was forbidden by the law. Yeah. So... God drew the line. Exactly. And that's the key. God has drawn the line. He had drawn that line previously. But the problem is, is that the people of Israel, they weren't following that standard. They weren't following those truths. So they were in the mess that they were in with a broken down city and broken down wall because of they were not keeping their marriages pure. They weren't keeping the Sabbath day holy. They weren't supporting the work of the priests and the Levites in the temple. And so when you think about they, they rebuild this wall, it's kind of the, the, physical, um, the physical line of the city, of the, the boundary around the city, saying we're inside, we're Jews, and the outside is outside of the Jewish nation. And now here they are restoring their spiritual hearts, and now they're putting a spiritual line, so to speak, in the sand. Yeah, Eric, go ahead. When we think about God drawing the line, there's there's a realization that they're on the wrong side of the line that God has drawn. And there's a, there's a realization that we're going to uphold the line that God has drawn, which means yeah. I need to submit myself to Him, and I'm going to uphold the line He has drawn. That's right. Which means I need to draw some lines in my own life. Yeah. Uh, but those lines are in conjunction with what God has already established. Right. God has established. There's no compromise, right? There's no messing around by Nehemiah anymore. And how long did this take? Right? We find out how long he's been here and how long this has taken. Uh, you look at verse 6. The 32nd year of Artaxerxes. So we know that date, that year, coincides with chapter 1. Right? That's 12 years. 12 years he's been restoring the wall. 12 years he's been restoring the hearts, the spiritual hearts of the people. So when you think about the kind of spiritual lines that he drew, ultimately, who drew those lines originally, right? It's God. God had drawn those lines originally. Um, 
Nehemiah didn't create this standard. Nehemiah didn't um, didn't write the laws that they were following. We look at uh, verse number one again of chapter thirteen. On that day, they read from the book of Moses. Right? It wasn't the book of Nehemiah. It was the book of Moses. And you know, you go back previously to the to the chapters that we have read, namely chapter eight. It's the book of the law. Right? They're not reading something new. They're not reading something that Nehemiah just wrote. These are things that have been in place for years and years and years. Right? Any thoughts or comments so far on any of this? Yeah, Jeff, go ahead. This the scene reminds me of, of when Jesus cleansed the temple uh, and drove out overturned the tables. And you can almost kind of see uh, the connection of over years of time they changed their ways and then just made the temple a place where you just go do things. Yeah. Instead of what it should be a holy place. Right. And how much so our lives are like that. Um, <laughs> you think about how many years it took for the people of Israel to get to where they were, and it wasn't overnight. This, you know, Nehemiah, Nehemiah wasn't in the city of Jerusalem for a year, and it was fixed. The wall wasn't fixed, and the, their spiritual hearts wasn't fixed. It took 12 years for them to even get to this point, and they're still struggling. And that should speak to us today. I mean, it takes time. It takes time to, to rebuild where we were before. And Nehemiah is realizing that here with 12 years. And did anything stick out with, to you um, in verse number one? Anything stick out to you? And it was found written that no Ammonite or Moabite should ever enter the assembly of God. Right, and they separated from everyone of foreign descent. Does anybody come to mind that was a Moabite descent? Ruth. Ruth, right? So you think about what separates right, an Ammonite specifically mentioned here and a Moabite specifically mentioned here. It wasn't the fact that they were Jew and non-Jew. It wasn't their genetic material right, separated by their faith. Right? Ruth was a faithful woman. She followed God. She had faith in him. And so when you think about that difference here, it's not solely based on, you know, they separated from Israel all those of foreign descent in verse 3. Right? There's that faith aspect here. Right? They're building walls spiritually, so to speak. And so, how do we draw these spiritual lines today? How do we draw these spiritual lines today? Let's go to Ephesians chapter 6. Ephesians chapter 6. Ephesians chapter 6. Let's, let's read verses 10 through 12. It says there in Ephesians chapter 6, starting there in verse 10, Finally, be strong in the Lord in the strength of His might. Put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand against the schemes of the devil. For do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the cosmic powers over this present darkness, against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly places. How do we draw these spiritual boundaries today? Just like Nehemiah did. Tough. Yeah, David. Again, God's drawing the line between what's truth and what's error. And we see that throughout the, the epistles, too. You know, Paul points out that some people said the resurrection is already passed. And so he called them out by yeah. name. And so you know, those that were. Teaching spiritual error in Romans uh, 16 says, so make a note of it. Yeah. You know, 2 Corinthians 5, don't keep company with a brother that's yeah. a fornicator, yeah. among other things. And I, what you, going by what you said there, Nehemiah chapter 13, if you're going to draw a spiritual boundary, so to speak, of 
this is God's laws and this isn't. I'm going to follow God's law. Do you invite the thing that's sinful, the thing that's worldly into your home to stay? No, you don't, right? You keep that as far away from you as possible. Right? Yeah, Merrick, go ahead. I think it's uh, <clears throat> very much symbolic that Nehemiah decides to build a wall. He decides to spearhead the action to build a wall around Jerusalem. And at the heart of what they were dealing with was their inability to separate themselves from the nations around them. Yeah. And here they have their, their enemy living in the very temple, the heart yeah. of, of this city that they've now built a wall around. Yeah. Yeah, you don't invite someone who's going to cause you to sin and have them stay in your home. Right? The enemy is supposed to be outside of the walls. Enemy is supposed to be outside of those boundaries. But now he is living right here among the Jews. So, what about Christians? What about Christians that are tolerating practices that God never accepted? How can we be like Nehemiah and restore God's standard? Let's go to Galatians, the book of Galatians. This is a it's a hard question. One that I this was a hard lesson actually for me to prepare. But this was a hard question for me to even write because it's a tough that's tough. That's a tough conversation. It may be a necessary one, but it's a tough conversation to have. You know, you look at Galatians chapter two and verse eleven. But when Cephas came to Antioch, I opposed him to his face. Does that sound pleasant to anybody? Right. But it was necessary, wasn't it? Because Peter was acting in a way that wasn't right. And Paul confronted him, didn't he? And then you look at uh, Galatians chapter 6, verse 1. Brothers, if anyone is caught in any tres- transgression, you who are spiritual should restore him in a spirit of gentleness. Keep watch o- on yourself, lest you too be tempted. Bear one another's burdens and so fulfill the law of Christ. So when something like this happens, what's what's our attitude? How do we go about restoring someone that maybe has allowed those spiritual boundaries to break down just like Nehemiah, Nehemiah's time? Yeah, Jeff. Well, we can start with just how Nehemiah did in, in chapter 13, 1. So you read from the book of Moses. And you, yeah. you have to open it up and see what it says. And what better way to do it with another brother that has issues? Yeah, that's a good point. Open our eyes as well. Let's go back to the standard that God has laid out. Right? Yeah, Seth, go ahead. It seems like the examples you just read, but there's a time to get in someone's face and there's a time to ease into a discussion, ease into... Yeah. Maybe it takes, like we said, 12 years before they finally got this done. And maybe it takes a long time before you get to the point where you can help someone in that way. Or or if you begin helping, it takes a long time. You know, I think about being converted, being baptized. That wasn't, usually it isn't, you hear one time and you go up and you're baptized. And so many times people are converted not right here, but they're converted around a kitchen table in a living room. What I mean by that is there are personal studies, one-on-one or a small group setting. It's not because of a sermon and they come forward. Right? Most of the time it's because they've had an in-depth relationship, a very deep conversation spiritually with one-on-one or a small group. Right? And so when you think about having that type of situation here, sometimes it's one-on-one. It's a small group setting. And those things are how those things get accomplished. Yeah, Eric, go ahead. There's a, to me, there's a clear difference in the two, two examples you referenced in Galatians. One of yeah. them is about Peter um, talking about circumcision. We see that in other, other, other letters. You know, there's a, there's a correlation there with, with, with the text in Acts. About preaching that you have to be circumcised and eating with eating with those who are uncircumcised and him being called the carpet in front of that, and so we see kind of Paul addressing that issue. That's a, that's an issue of false doctrine yeah. at some level. Um, 
where the context in Galatians 6 and verse 1 is there's a brother who's caught in sin. Yeah. And so there's there's a nature to Seth's point of gentleness and how you go about that. Uh, those are two different approaches. And so yeah. when someone's struggling with something, uh, me confronting them face to face and opposing them in that stark contrast is probably not going to be effective. Uh, but if there's false doctrine, if there's false teaching, or if there's uh, uncertainty about what, what the Bible teaches, then it's a clear expectation of what we need to do. We need that stand as we talk about Sunday morning. Yeah, yeah Craig, go ahead. I'm going to answer your next question, too. Okay. I didn't mean to put that up. I actually like like that. So. Take it away. Okay. <laughs> um, well, in the context of what we're talking about, really in all three of all three of the questions that are up there, first and foremost, when you think about you know, when you're drawing spiritual boundaries, why are we drawing those boundaries? Well, our relationship is first with God. And that's what Nehemiah's relationship was. That's why he was defending what he was defending. That's why he was, you might say, righteously indignant about what happened. That's why he was so filled with fervor to take care of it. It wasn't personal in that he was upset that what the person had done, or what the Bible had done to him personally. He was defending God. So that's where the first relationship is and what we defend is. And you think about the two examples of Peter and, and what we read in Galatians and even your next question there. You know, as a parent, think about children and how you deal with children who knew what they should not be doing and you have to rebuke them or punish them something that they have been told or something that they well knew versus a child who starts to do something wrong who didn't know you still correct it you still take care of it and you still take them away from that danger but it's a different approach but the your goal is still the same both times is to keep them from being hurt or doing something wrong or going on the wrong path but you may have to approach it differently from time to time yeah Yeah. let's see a hand over here Uh, Kevin and then Rich but while we're going there go to uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 6 1 Corinthians chapter 6 Kevin go ahead well how how do you how do you do that with uh, other Christians when we restudy or be diligent so we can rightly handle God's word. Yeah. We can get twisted around sometimes. Yeah. God is not a respecter of persons. Does anybody think God's prejudiced? No. But if somebody accuses us of being prejudiced, we know that that's not good. But it might be a trick. If God has already judged some action to be sinful, He's prejudged that kind of behavior but he hasn't been prejudiced for anybody and so we have to just keep being diligent to know all of what God says about it. God has set the standard right we haven't and if we're teaching somebody or um, as we read in Galatians you know bearing someone's burden or, or opposing someone to their face right? it's not us saying those things it's God God has already put that standard in place. Rich, go ahead. Some of them, I've had to talk to people about certain things. Uh, it's not so much that they know they've sinned. Even a non-Christian, they don't have to be told they were wrong. Take this, the guy that just got sentenced for killing that girl down in Ohio State, Reagan Cove. You know, I guess you can ask that guy if he was if he knew he was wrong. He was he knew he was wrong. He didn't need to he didn't even have to read the Bible to know that. Our our society, the way it's been built from day one, has been on Judeo Christian values. It's just baked in. We just, people just know this stuff. The thing that they have a hard time getting their head around is the fact that there's an accountability to God. I think that's more the hard part is that your soul is in danger unless you can get to that point where you know that you have to repent of these things. I think that's really the hard part. The easy part is actually coming to grips with, yeah, I, I messed up. I think so many times, even with us, we read the Bible and doesn't agree with the things that I'm choosing to do or things that I'm participating in. 
And so many times we want to change what the Bible says. But when we read the Bible and we realize that those changes need to be made, it's us, right? It's not the Bible that needs to change. It's not the standard that God has laid out that needs to change. God has already revealed those truths. It's me. It's my heart. It's my decisions, my actions that need to change ultimately, right? 1 Corinthians chapter 6, there in verse 11. Uh, this is such a great phrase, you know, in the middle of this, this book. And such were some of you. you know, these people here in the city of Corinth, were, they used to struggle with these things that people struggle with today. But they were washed by, Jesus, by the blood of Jesus. Such were some of you. And so when I think about Galatians 6, and you look at 1 Corinthians chapter 6, that spirit of gentleness, right? being tender-hearted, being um, patient. Sometimes that type of attitude, when you're talking about somebody from that's struggling with something, or maybe they're not even a Christian, that type of attitude and, and gentleness and patience, love, right? that'll change their heart. Right? It's not the beat down <laughs> that you see... Um, you know, let's say Galatians chapter 2 with Paul and Peter. Any comments or questions? Yeah, Jake, go ahead. Well, I'll point out that Peter was a Christian. He was a fellow yeah, believer. He was. he was, you know, stood up to. So there, there's, you, especially with Paul and his writings and his, his all of his epistles, um, he has, he definitely has some compassion and he has time to be gentle with people but then he also knows that there's some things and it's not just the false teaching it's sometimes a sin it really doesn't, you, know, you can't categorize okay well when it's this type of sin then I need to be gentle or when it's this type of sin it really just matters on the people on who right. you're talking to not necessarily the type of sin because one person you can beat them over the head and they're, they're not going to listen to you and then the next you can be very gentle and they're not going to listen to you because yeah. they're not going to get it yeah. So it just depends. I mean, sometimes we're so afraid, you know, we're so, you know, in, in the pursuit of being, trying to be gentle and loving, we also don't realize that there's also just as much authority, biblical authority, to be a little bit harder on people because we see Paul doing it a, a good bit. But he also is gentle a good bit, too. So we can't just say, you know, well, we need to lean more on the loving side. Yeah. We, you know, you got to make sure that there's, there's definitely a good bit of both. Yeah. You just got to be wise enough to... Yeah. Yeah. That's a good point. Let's go to Third John. Third John. Any other hands raised? Uh, Third John. This is a short, short book. Um, we'll start reading verse one. Third John. The elder to the beloved Gaius, whom I love in truth. Beloved, I pray that all may go well with you, and that all, that you may be in good health as it goes well with your soul. I rejoice greatly when the brothers came and testified to your truth, as indeed you are walking in the truth. I have no greater joy than to hear that my children are walking in the truth. Beloved, it is a faithful thing you do in all your efforts for these brothers, strangers as they are, who testify to your love before the church. You will do well to send them on their journey in a manner worthy of God. For they have gone out for the sake of the name, accepting nothing from the Gentiles. Therefore, we ought to support people like these that we may be fellow workers for the truth. I have written something to the church, but Diotrephes, who likes to put himself first and does not acknowledge our authority. So if, if I come, I will bring up what he is doing, talking wicked nonsense against us and not content with that, he refuses to welcome the brothers and also stops those who want to and puts them out of the church. Beloved, do not imitate evil, but imitate good. Whoever does good is from God. Whoever does evil has not seen God. Demetrius has received a good testimony from everyone and from the truth itself. We also add our testimony, and you know that our testimony is true. I had much to write to you, but I would rather not write with pen and ink. I hope to see you soon, and we will talk face to face. Peace be to you, and the friends greet you. Greet the friends, each by name. Three men are specifically mentioned here in Third John, and they had made spiritual partnerships. And you think about how these men are described, right? You look at um, Gaius in verse 3. 
testify to your truth, and indeed you are walking in the truth. Demetrius, um, what's the standard here? He received a good testimony from everyone and from the truth itself. And you look at the Diotrephes, the way he's described as wicked nonsense. So you think about two different types of spiritual boundaries here, and the material goes into this much deeper. Um, but you have two men who are... Their standard of truth is God's truth, God's standard, God's laws. And John recognizes that. But the man who is compromising, who is associating with things that are evil, things that are worldly, there's no truth in him. The way he describes him is wicked nonsense. Right? He's even putting others outside of the truth. If you have uh, want to study that further... I would encourage you to, to look at the material. The, the material goes in way deeper than, um, than what we covered now currently. Let's go to 1 Corinthians chapter 10. 1 Corinthians chapter 10. This is the most that we have read outside of the book of Nehemiah. Most of the time... The last ten weeks, we've basically stayed in the book of Nehemiah, but I think with this lesson, it was necessary to go outside of of that book and just look at other other books because of the last three weeks, you'll see how it kind of plays out. But 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verses 5, 6, and 11. verse, Verse 6 says, Now these things took place as examples for us that we might not desire evil As they did. Verse 11. Now these things happened to them as an example, but they were written down for our instruction on whom the end of the ages has come. So when you think about the history of the Israelites, which we read uh, last week in chapter 9, but it also recounts it here in chapter 10, just very briefly. How do we apply past examples and past instruction today? How do we apply things that have happened in the past, and how do we allow them to instruct our lives today? That's a broad question. Yeah, Craig. Well, Paul says specifically that they were, he's recounting them as an example, so that tells us that we should learn something. Uh, He says something similar in Romans 15.4 that we often quote, about the fact that we're in the past or in our learning. So, Though it was a different covenant, it doesn't mean there's nothing there for us to learn from. Yeah. And you look at, with that in mind, verse number 12. Therefore, because all of these things are examples, because all of these things are written down for your instruction, therefore, right, let anyone who thinks that he stands take heed lest he fall. Right? These things are here for us, for you, for me. That if we think that we can go through this life, go through this world, and have our own spiritual boundary, so to speak, and not have any worry for what God has to say, guess what? We're going to be in a world of hurt because God has set the standard. And there are people in this Bible, people in this book, even that we have read this quarter, the Nehemiah, that have struggled with things, struggled with things in this life things of sin, things of the world. And guess what? We can learn from them. And if we think that we stand, we're going to fall. And that's the warning here. Verse 13, God is faithful. God is faithful. He will provide the way of escape that you may be able to endure it. So with that in mind, how does that apply to verse 23? 1 Corinthians chapter 10 and verse 23 says, All things are lawful, but not all things are helpful. All things are lawful, but not all things build up. Think about having a partnership or an association or fellowship with something in this world. How does that apply here in verse 23? Jake and then Craig. Some things in this world may not be necessarily inherently unholy, or well, not necessarily sinful. 
um, but they can be unholy. That means there's things in this world that can make you look, pretty much look and act and, and just kind of, if someone were to look at you and, and what you're doing and who you're hanging around with, you, there's no distinction between you and the world. Yeah. You're, just, you're just like the world. Now, that doesn't mean that necessarily what you're doing is sinful, uh, although a lot of times it is, but sometimes you just look unholy and you're just acting unholy. You're acting not consecrated. You're acting not like a priest, which we ought to be. And so there's things in this world, many, many things that are lawful, but that doesn't mean they're profitable or holy. Um, it doesn't yeah. mean it's for the best. It doesn't mean it's for your best or for your, your brother and sister's best. There's a lot of things that can distract me that can take up my time, right? That I can say, well, it's not against the law. It's not against the law for me to work 100 hours a week if I wanted to. It's not against the law for me to, I don't know, fill in the blank. Right? But if those things take away from my ability to serve God, a time to serve God, right, are those things helpful? Do those things build up? That's what Paul's getting at here. Where is my focus? Think about Nehemiah. His focus was on building the wall and restoring the hearts of the people. If he was distracted, there's no way he could get that done. Right? His focus was on restoring the hearts of the people here. Craig, go ahead. Just to add to what Jake said, that you can take the context of this chapter. There's things that he could do, but he's telling them, don't do those things if they're going to cause someone to stumble. But the end, that's what he goes on to say. So, we need to consider in our spiritual journey, we think about our spiritual boundaries, what, what's wise. Um, does, it, does it take us further away from God? Whether it's something that's not inherently wrong in and of itself. Um, those are the small steps that the Israelites took over a few hundred years that left them in captivity. Yep. Um, they got them further and further. At first, it was something that was a matter of convenience as far as where they would worship, and then it became wrong, and different things like that. So. It was a gradual decline for them. Yeah, Eric, go ahead. It makes me ask the question, helpful for what? All things are lawful, but not all things are helpful. Helpful for what? So he, he continues on explaining you know, about eating meats and those types of things. Then he gets to verse 33, not seeking my own advantage, but that of the many, that they may be saved. That's his goal, saving souls. And so if it, helps, if it doesn't help us accomplish saving souls, why are we doing it? Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, Seth, go ahead. Jump back when you're talking about in verse 11 about it being there for our instruction. And I started to think about all the quotes you hear of history repeating itself for sure. Learn history so you don't repeat it. I just did a quick Google search. Um, the human condition being what it is, as far as the, even just in the Bible, we have all the examples of, you know, this cycle of. It repeating itself over and over. But George Bernard Shaw said, if history repeats itself and the unexpected always happens, how incapable must man be of learning from experience? And uh, Mark Twain said, it is not worthwhile to try to keep history from repeating itself, for man's character will always make the, make the preventing of the repetitions impossible. So on our own, we're no good. Yeah. We have to learn from those examples, right? I see another hand over here. All right. The last thing I want to close with is Philippians chapter 3. Philippians chapter 3. And, you know, we could go to Romans chapter 12 and verse 2 to answer this question. But when I think about kind of our theme for the year and our focus and where we're going uh, for the theme, I think about Philippians chapter 3 and verse 12. Not that I have already obtained this or am already perfect, but I press on to make it my own because Christ Jesus has made me his own. Brothers, I do not consider that I have made it my own. But one thing I do, forgetting what lies behind and straining forward to what lies ahead, I press on toward the goal for the prize of the upward call of God in Christ Jesus. How do I keep myself from being pulled down and dragged down and distracted with things of the world? I press on to the goal of Jesus Christ. The prize of all of those things that Paul's talking about here. I press on to make it my own. That's my 
personal, spiritual line in the sand for me. That's what we have to do. If we're going to draw a line of fellowship, take that phrase from this title, for this material, that's where it has to be. My focus has to be on Jesus. It can't be on anything else if I'm going to strive to have that eternal crown of glory. Thank you so much for your kind attention and, and participation here this evening. Thank you for being here.